Hey, hey, welcome everyone to this week's episode of the Amazon Files brought to you by Mommy Income. I am your host, Kristen Ostrander, and today we are welcoming back Leslie Hensel from Riverbend, our favorite um, person who talks all about the, the ins and outs of Amazon, how to protect and keep your account safe, keep yourself above board, because y'all, you are building long-term sustainable businesses, and Amazon likes to put monkey wrenches in that all the time, and so keeping up, that's why you hear from Leslie all the time, because she is kind of our, our in-house um, person to go to when we have questions about all the crazy things that Amazon decides to do, policies, violations, um, intellectual property issues, suspended you know, all the fun stuff that we have to do at Amazon. So <laughs> welcome, Leslie. Thanks for coming back. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Well, we honestly, we just can't live without you. That's why you're back. Um, we would love to ask you all these questions. So we're just going to jump right into it. I want to do this like at least once a quarter so that we can kind of just bring you in even for a short time. What's new? What's going on? What people need mm -hmm. to be aware of? All the things, the gunk that you're seeing behind the scenes to just keep put people in the know to protect their accounts. Because as much as Amazon is a mean, crazy beast, they're also making a lot of everybody to sustain businesses and they are right. doing some things right. So um, compliance is a big thing and we want to make sure we do that. So uh, can you give us a little bit about what's what's been going on and the behind the scenes in Amazon and what we need to be aware of as of right now? Yes, your frenemy Amazon has been doing some new things uh, that are very interesting. One that is affecting a lot of our sellers is they are getting restricted products notifications for products that are either a pesticide <laughs> or um, some other kind of restricted products notification. So those are the dog pages that you see when you go to a product and it's got one of Amazon's happy dogs sitting there looking at you, looking so friendly and nice. Uh, those pages a lot of times were taken down for restricted products. So restricted products is there for a really good reason. Amazon has a restricted products team because people list things that are illegal to sell. Um, and they are supposed to take those things down, but they use technology to spot illegal products. So they are looking for keywords in the listings a lot of times to take them down. And sometimes they're a little too broad with those keywords. Uh, sometimes they put keywords that aren't relevant and they'll yank a lot of stuff down that shouldn't be yanked down. So lately there are a lot of things being yanked down as pesticides that are not actually pesticides, like say a shirt or Trying to, I think we have some greeting cards taken down for being pesticides. Some, we, had oh, one, we had one that was um, plastic cutlery. Oh, clearly a pesticide along yeah, with I posters. Mean, super dangerous. Posters. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of people freak out at these because, I'll tell you why, because if you email back to them, if you hit reply and say, hey, obviously this is plastic cutlery, this is not a pesticide, they will not fix it. Uh, you have to really prove to them that this is, shouldn't be yanked for being a pesticide. So you have to go through all of the keywords, uh, the back end keywords, as well as all of the listings, see if there's any words. So uh, I'm imagining for cutlery, you may say it's very sanitary to use plastic. I'm just guessing at something, right? But it could be very sanitary to use plastic cutlery at a party right now because of COVID. So if you had the word sanitary in there, they might yank it down because it's implying some kind of a pesticidal use for a product. Ah, so have, that is, a, and say we did do the traditional route of saying this and that, but we just, what we did was we sent them the, the um, SDS sheet of all the ingredient type things, or I, I say ingredients as if it's made out of food, but like the idea <laughs> of like, what was the chemical makeup of it? And that was enough, but we didn't know to check the, all of the different keywords and make sure it wasn't like, how, how would this get flagged? It's, it doesn't make sense. So thanks for that. That's really helpful to comb through the words. Are any words particularly that they're standing out among um, what you've seen? I mean, sanitary, obviously that's one. Yes, anything related to a cleaning product, anything that you may be using it in a different way for your non-pesticidal product, um, but anything that's related to uh, something being sanitary or antibacterial or clean, 
Um, even the word clean has gotten things pulled down. You just have to really look for things that are related to COVID. They're being very aggressive with any product claiming that it is going to keep you from getting sick or keep your family well, keep you safe. Um, some of this is actually based on actions by the EPA uh, against Amazon. Uh, they're getting very, very aggressive against Amazon. And if you read some of the EPA documents, they flagged stuff for saying things like keeps your family safe, flagged it. So this isn't just Amazon. This is the EPA going after Amazon. So then the Amazon, then Amazon passes the, the glory and happiness on to you. <laughs> you say but, that so nicely. I just love your sarcasm <laughs> because that's really real. We have to make the best of it. But the reality is like they shoot first and ask questions later. And I that's do. just always how they've been operating for the 13 years or more that I've been on Amazon. So it, so that just that makes a lot of sense. OK, so pesticides. And then they're still doing that pesticide quiz thing where you have to pass yes. the little test where they say you need to take the little class and watch the video videos and answer the questions and then you're past the test for pesticides. So I don't know if anybody else has seen that, but we had to take it in our business to like tell them that we were qualified to um, at least understand what pesticides were, even though our cutlery was flagged for pesticidal use. So that that's, I mean, we got ours back reinstated, but I'm going to go back now and look at the listing and see even if any of those other words are in there. So great. Right. Tip. Cause it could happen again. You don't want it to come down. They'll take it down over and over. Actually, I found the pesticide class quite illuminating. Um, there are so many things that Amazon makes you do that are uh, annoying and stupid. But in this case, um, they were explaining about claims. And you can learn a lot about claims from this pesticide class that apply to other things like beauty products and foods, health foods, um, when it's telling you you cannot make any of these claims. And I, I think people don't realize you can have a listing where you're just trying to write good marketing copy and they're seeing it as a health claim. So yes, I, you know what? Here's a question I had from a client recently. So I'm glad you brought that up. She asked, um, she put like a little disclaimer, you know, like on the TV commercials where they're like, you know, they, they're they they're selling supplements or something and they're like, this has not been re regulated by the FDA and we are mm -hmm. making no claims that it can cure a disease or whatever. Is that enough to have like a disclaimer within your listing or is that even allowed at all? Because I have a client that put that in there um, because there's something she has that I think might be topical or some sort of something or maybe it was essential oils. And, and, and so it was one of those things where she has a disclaimer as one of her bullet points it says we are making no claims that this can cure any disease you know it's, it's the exact wording that they require is that enough to kind of get you through the door with that so it's really two separate issues the marketing copy claims anything that you're saying that your product will do that they don't like either because of the fda the epa uh, something similar to that um, you still can't have those however disclaimers on products are fantastical and everyone should have them uh, they can actually uh, you know, they don't protect you so much in litigation. You should at least have them on there to show that you care. Like if someone had a problem with your product and decided to sue you, your best defense is a good insurance policy, not the disclaimer on your product. <laughs> yeah. But uh, Amazon does like them. Uh, it does make Amazon feel better. And so if you're having a safety issue, for example, where someone says, your supplement sent me to the ER because I had stomach cramps or whatever. If you've got a nice disclaimer on there, it will help you get the listing back up. So we always recommend uh, disclaimers. And especially if there is some kind of safety oriented information that you should include. Now that will help you in a litigation situation. For example, patch testing. So I'm sure you've seen this before on a product where uh, it says, you know, use this on a small area of skin first and wait this amount of time. And if it's OK, then you can use it um, or start with the smallest dose of this supplement and see how you do. And then you can increase to the full dosage. Those, oh, and, and essential oils, it's huge to tell people whether they can put it directly on their skin or they need a carrier oil. You've got to have that in there. All of those shouldn't only be on the packaging. They should also be in the listing so people know what to expect and you're really covering yourself. So if someone does come after you, you can say, look, I put this on the package. I put it on the listing. It explains exactly what to do. And unfortunately, a small percentage of the population will always be allergic to something, right? right. <laughs> you're never going to have a product that everyone can use. It just doesn't exist.
Yeah, I, I so appreciate that, you guys. This is the reason we have Leslie on, because she always <laughs> knows the things that some of us just are oblivious to, or we think something is one small thing. And especially as bundlers, when we're bundling multiple items together, we need to be aware that we're not claiming that, you know, this, this product is literally going to cure any disease or help you with this. It is, you know, there's lots of different marketing words that you can use to enhance the, um, you know, enhance your experience without saying, you know, this can make your diabetes go away. I remember right. when years ago when the diabetes thing first came out and we were selling um, some sort, I think it was like gold bond or something like diabetic foot cream, right? And oh. it was selling like crazy. And all of a sudden, Amazon pulled anything that said the word diabetic in it at all, because unless it was an actual diabetic supply by a medical company, you couldn't even say diabetic foot cream, because then you were claiming that somehow this can you know, heal this or that. And I remember getting these big, long emails and then pulling things. I'm like, oh, well, there goes that. Uh, so I, I just d definitely paying attention to those types of things. So so thank you for that. That's the, the disclaimer. So anybody, if you've got any sort of thing, now is this just top, and ingestibles or, or um, things like that? Or is this is this also for other type of safety products? Like, I mean, I know the whole hoverboard thing got them sued so bad that they changed everything. <laughs> yeah. um, so what type of products would you recommend having safety features on? Or so, a disclaimer, I mean. Right. So anything that you can imagine that someone is going to misuse, because let's face it, a lot of times when people get hurt by products, it is because of misuse or not easing their way into a product. So I'll give you one of my favorite examples of the past. I had someone who was selling kitchen blow torches. And so there are those little ones that you use like to make creme brulee. Mm -hmm. And they had no disclaimers on their listing or their packaging. They didn't really have good instructions. And then they also had bad manufacturing. And unfortunately it was splitting apart at the top near the flame. And so then the butane was like spilling out and it was actually making like a flamethrower, right? Um, so now- I'm so you know, sorry, you I'm just sitting here going, I'm still <laughs> stuck at someone trying to sell kitchen blow torches. I'm like, wait a second, <laughs> like out of all the products that you want to sell, why on earth would you pick that? And I mean, for Amazon, I mean, that just seems like a nightmare anyway. <laughs> Well, and you make a great point there, Kristen. I mean, that is really the point, isn't it? Just because you can sell something doesn't mean you should. And there's nothing wrong with selling a kitchen blowtorch. Mm -hmm. But do you really want to? Because yeah. there's so many ways people can misuse them or bizarre accidents can happen, even if you actually had a good one that didn't split at the top and have the butane spill out, right? Mm -hmm. um, it, another, another example uh, someone had these car seat warmers. So it was like a seat cover you would lay over your existing seat and it would warm, warm you up and you plugged it into the lighter mm -hmm. in your car. And it, it, it should not have been used in any car that was prior to a certain year because mm -hmm. I guess the voltage changed or they just didn't feel like it was safe or whatever. They had that disclaimer on the listing and not on the packaging for the product or the instructions. Hmm. So you really just have to think through how many times are you going to tell someone? You need to tell them every opportunity where there's a, because it caught on fire, right? Mm -hmm. I knew you, you already knew that <laughs> it caught mm -hmm. on fire in these older cars. So someone, uh, you know, plugged it into their ancient Ford Pinto and it just, <laughs> right, caught on fire. Yeah. <laughs> So, and yes, these were sold on Amazon. Lovely. Um, so you really have to think through, number one, do you even want to sell this product? Do you want to sell a bug zapper that plugs into an electrical outlet? Because I don't, because I can see how that can go wrong 10 different ways. Do you want to sell anything that creates any kind of fire or spark? No, probably not. Um, if you want to sell anything ingestible, you really need to think about it, have a great manufacturer and have great disclaimers and have an amazing insurance policy. I actually sell ingestibles. I have a very expensive insurance policy. So whereas most people buy the $500 insurance policy, mine is $4,000 a year yeah. um, because I sell these ingestibles and because the insurance company, you know, they know what that means uh, when you're selling supplements and you gotta be careful. So do you even wanna sell the product? Do you have good insurance? And then how many times are you telling the user 
about the safety information about how to use it properly. And, you know, you should be telling them on the listing, on the packaging, in an insert, in the instructions, as many different ways as you can, um, because the public doesn't always pay attention. <laughs> How many of us, I just laugh at that because how many of us have returns because people don't read listings? I mean, oh, they yeah. don't even read the listing. They're like, well, I thought this came with this and this. And I'm like, did you read the bullet points? Because literally it says this includes X, Y, Z. Yet you thought you were getting something else. How did mm -hmm. you come to this conclusion? So basically yeah. over deliver. If you are going to, <laughs> and especially the private label, right? So if you're private labeling something like that, that could even essentially, especially if it's for babies or children, that's obviously way up there along with ingestibles and topicals and things mm -hmm. like that. If you have to put it on or in your body or on or in or around a child, um, these are the highest safety standards that you need. So over deliver delivering on disclaimers and instructions, let's be honest, not everybody is the sharpest tool in the shed and they need multiple ways to make sure they understand that you're telling them that this is for a specific use. So another question that has come through has been uh, with the recent um, you know, whether this is controversial or not, or people agree with it or not, I get a lot of questions about this and I'm like, ah, I'll save that for Leslie. Um, <laughs> CBD oils and cannabis products and things like that, because in some states it's completely illegal and other places it's completely legal, Colorado, Michigan, like some other of these states that are just completely recreational, open, totally fine. And then there's states like, I think Alabama or Georgia or places that are still completely illegal. So how do you see the products on Amazon? So what are the, some of the regulations or rules or suspensions you've seen um, based on things surrounding cannabis or cannabis oil or things like that or CBD stuff? Amazon doesn't allow CBD. Okay. The end. And see everyone. So then everyone says, but I have this spectrum oil or I have this or that, the other, I have all these variations on it that are okay. Okay. So there is stuff you can sell. So hemp products are okay in some forms, but not in others. There's actually some re a really detailed list that's in the help on Amazon. So it talks about like anything that has seeds you can't have. And uh, here's the real problem. Someone will sell a product that may or may not have CBD in it. Sometimes you cannot tell. And then when you look in their keywords, they will have all these slang street words for various drugs. And a lot of times they don't just have words for marijuana. They will have words for other street drugs, including some that I have to Google because I've never heard of them. Before. <laughs> <laughs> right. But they'll have things like salvia and, you know, all these other um, words in there that are prohibited products by Amazon because salvia salvia is a plant that is gorgeous and blooms in your yard and it also can get you high. Mm -hmm. So um, there's all kinds of street drug names that turn up in these listings. And so then Amazon is wondering what's really in that bottle? Mm -hmm. Are you really selling a hemp product, which should be fine? Or are you selling an illegal drug and you're advertising it through these keywords and then you're telling people out there, just search for this on Amazon or giving them a link and you're using Amazon as a fence essentially for your illegal drug operation. That is why they are stricter than people think they should be. Also, um, Amazon doesn't really have the ability to gate where it sells things. They, they cannot do regional banding Mm -hmm. um, the way that you think they might be able to, they really can't. And that's why a lot of times if something, it's always California, mm -hmm. if California passes some proposition and says, you know, you cannot sell this product, then it gets really hard for all the rest of us to get it, even though it's, yeah. And so, so damn Cal California. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so with California, a lot of times Amazon will still allow a product to be sold, but it'll say cannot sell in California. Blah, 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 blah. Well, they're not going to play that game with any kind of CBD product because the regulations vary sometimes from city to city, county to county, state to state. It's not just state to state. That would be easier. But even then, those are changing really quickly. The, imagine the program that programming that would go into trying to continually restrict sales. Um, and also, for example, I live in a city that's actually in two counties. 
So what if it was allowed in one county and not in the other? It's just a moving target. They don't want to go there. There's liability issues with all of these products. They don't want to go there either. Um, there's problems with minors purchasing these products because even in states where they're legal, minors cannot buy them. They don't want to go there. It's not like the liquor thing where there's licensing and you know all these rules that have been in place a long time that people understand. It's just not going to happen. So even with, so I've got someone who sells hemp gummies, for example. Um, and I'll tell you, it's not worth it from my perspective. Now, they may make a lot of money off these hemp gummies, but me as a seller, I wouldn't want to go there. And I'll tell you why. They get pulled down every freaking week. And we have to go back and explain why this product is compliant. And we give them the SDS and we give them the COA and all the things. And Amazon accepts it. And then they pull it down again. And uh, it, it just, it happens over and over again. One last point of why these are too much trouble to sell. Most of these fall in the supplement category. Supplements are the dirtiest, ugliest category on Amazon, especially anything that isn't a standard supplement. So I'm not talking vitamin C and lysine. I'm talking about like anything that is a male enhancement product or a, a women's skin product or a go gain 10 pounds at the gym product, right? All of those. I want the opposite of that, whatever that is. <laughs> well, I mean. <laughs> right. Weight loss supplements, right? Like the make you two. skinny people. Yeah. Okay. That's what those, I mean. Those two along with the muscle builder, you know, right. muscle head stuff, right? All of these that are related more to outcomes instead of um, I need vitamin C. Um it's super competitive. There are tons and tons of private label sellers and they play dirty. They play really, really dirty. Lots of black hat stuff. So imagine if you will, you take this already dirty, filthy category and you add the CBD element into it or the hemp element to it. Oh my goodness. It's just vicious. Um, so the one of the clients that I've worked with on this has uh, Russians demanding Bitcoin. <laughs> um, because if they don't pay the Bitcoin, they're going to continue taking down their listings with false claims. I mean, this is for reals. And, and, and all the messages are in Russian and we have to put them through a translator. It's great. Um, yeah, it's, so it's, <laughs> they're fighting the mob over here at Riverbend. Just so you guys know, <laughs> we've got the KGB on our ass. Over well, it's, it's even more confusing because it's actually, we know who, we know who's doing this. So it's a U.S another U.S. seller who hires Russians, who are hackers, who do all this stuff to our clients' listings and then demand Bitcoin to make it stop. That's insane. I mean, <laughs> you guys, the things, just one lesson learned. What is the moral of the story? Stop selling supplements. Don't sell CBD. The end. <laughs> Supplements are tough, like standard supplements, good brands. If you're a reseller for a really good brand, that's great. Um, but a lot of these things that are more outcome oriented, it's just super competitive and really dirty and difficult. Um, and, and there's a lot of liability attached to them. But the CBD, I just wouldn't touch it because I cannot, I can see Amazon at some point even saying no hemp because there's just too much regulation and problem around all of this. I can see them saying no more, just like they did with tasers where they were like, no more tasers. We're going to sell them. No one else can. Now, what about straight up like marijuana or marijuana accessories? Obviously you can't sell marijuana on, on Amazon. I wasn't speaking of that, but like, I'll see a lot of things like, um, like the people that are growing and accessories for that. And they, they're using the word marijuana. They're using the word weed or pot or things like that. And I'm like, how are they getting away with this? I thought all these things were kind of restricted or are the accessories not restricted? Yeah, none of those are supposed to be allowed. Like grinders have not been allowed on Amazon forever and ever. Um, and every once in a while we'll find like a, you know, like a hookah kind of thing. And we're like, Oh wow, look at that. They use all these interesting words for it. Uh, you can't even sell um, art or a flag, a poster, a t-shirt with a marijuana leaf on it. But it's everywhere. It is. And so, you know, the Amazon catalog is massive and it's whack-a-mole. So they're taking stuff down as they find it. Now, how these things remain up when they actually have the keywords that are really obvious, I do not know. They have spiders that go through the catalog, you know, that are always slinking around and they're looking for prohibited listings. And that's one thing that really leads sellers astray is because you'll look on there and you'll see 20 
um, of these 20 or 30 listings for these vaginal pearls. That's another <laughs> of my favorites. And they're prohibited. But but you think, well, I can sell my vaginal pearls because there's 20 listings for them. Eventually, those 20 will all get taken down. But it's misleading to the new seller of that product who thinks, I can sell this because look at all these, but you can't. And yours might be the one that they catch and take down first. Yeah, that's super <laughs> That's interesting because I see I see so many things. I see things with great sales ranks. and I see things with all these different keywords. And then it's just like, but then you look at the restricted list and it says you may not. So right. it's kind of like the, the bad players are still playing bad. And, you know, some of them, I honestly, I, I feel like some of them Amazon overlooks because when you have a 5,000 sales rank and this is making them buku bucks, sometimes maybe they turn the other cheek with those ones because it's it's bringing in a lot of business. I don't know. But then you see some of the newer stuff. It's like, I, I mean, I was just doing accidental research the other day and found a ton of stuff that was like, I can't believe this is even on here. And how are they getting away with this? I mean, flat out said marijuana, such and such. And I was like, hmm. See, that's, those are the ones that are a little mind blowing because they should catch them by the keyword. There are a lot of listings out there where people will actually create listings. Uh, so, you know, vaping stuff isn't allowed on Amazon. And again, this is a jurisdictional issue because it can be different from city to city and for different ages. So they just can't go down that road because they're going to be selling to minors or whatever. Whatever They're going to be breaking the law. It's impossible yeah. to not break the law. Um, sure. So can't do any vaping stuff, including chargers, like a car charger for a vape pen, not even the vape pen. It's just a charger. Can't sell that either. So uh, there were a lot of people for a long time who were creating listings for their vape pen, but the, the listing would be nonsense. Like all the words, it was like for something else or for a nonsense product, but it would have the picture of the vape pen. It was very clear what you're getting. Then they would go out on other, they would send out an email or they would go out on social media and they would put links to the listing and they would sell a bunch of them. And then eventually Amazon would find it and they would take it down. Well, what Amazon started doing with specifically with vaping, and I'm sure that they've done it with other restricted products, but we've seen it a lot with these vaping guys, is they would hold their funds permanently. And the reason they would do it is because as soon as they took down that account, the guy would just create another account with another bunch of fake listings. And, mm -hmm. and they would rotate these listings. So they'd have one up for like two weeks. They'd get enough sales. They'd take it down. They'd create a new one, right? So they wouldn't get caught. It's pretty creepy. Um, but it was really crazy. But after the second or third time that they got caught and Amazon wouldn't release the funds and they figured out Amazon's never giving me my money back. They're like, huh, maybe I should stop doing this because I'm never getting. So people who say Amazon should never, ever hold funds. See, that's why they do it sometimes because people won't stop if you give them back the money why would they ever stop yeah i mean sometimes <laughs> people just will break the rules it, it's like those um scams where people was it posi scams or whatever those things are to where people will just like okay if we get shut down with this we'll just create another crazy mm -hmm. thing going on or with that like those people that did those amazon they before you know pre-covid when they were traveling around and doing these like seminars everywhere and then at the end they're like for twenty five thousand dollars we'll basically set you up a store give you all the products all these things guarantee you all this money and then you'd pay them the money and then they'd never help you and they'd never do anything they just left and they were just left you in the dust you know of course they got taken down and sued but i bet you those same people are now just figuring out some sort of other niche to rip people off because that's what they do um okay so let's talk about <laughs> has the new hazmat thing that you, you just had mentioned that earlier about uh, all of a sudden these new rules about hazmat and it came without warning and pretty much overnight so what is the hazmat nightmare we're now dealing with so not every seller is approved for hazmat you have to apply uh, to be approved for hazmat and have some history in the FBA program that you follow the rules, do things the way you're supposed to. Um, now, once you have hazmat, it's just like with your other storage level that it will on that little storage monitor that you see across the bottom of that screen that has your IPI number. So, you know, if you can send in more inventory. So at the bottom, it'll say you have this many cubic feet of hazmat storage. 
And just like other storage, your limit increases over time as you have volume. So if you filled that up, but you're moving the product, it would have increased your hazmat storage over time. So a couple of weeks ago, all of a sudden, uh, almost every hazmat seller out there had their hazmat capacity reduced by 80 to 90 percent. There was no warning given. Um, they just sent a notice and said, hey, your hazmat has been reduced by this much. You only have this many cubic feet of storage for hazmat, haha. -ha. And in some cases, they even told people they had to remove all that excess inventory, uh, which that to me was the most shocking part. It wasn't, you can sell down and then once you're out, you know, you don't get any more storage until you sell down and then you've only got this much. It was remove your stuff. Um, so if you read the notice that they sent out, Amazon made some claims around safety for its employees. This is all very confusing to me because first I have hazmat. It's in like seven warehouses. So most sellers have a very small amount of hazmat. So I've got like this much hazmat at seven warehouses, right? At seven different places. I am not causing fires or scary damage to employees. Um, but what's most upsetting, like I can live without my hazmat. I'm fine. I've got a seller who only sells hazmat products. Uh, it's a private label brand. They sell them through Amazon because it's actually comparably better for shipping. If they shipped it themselves, they couldn't do it. Um, like if you actually sh ship nail polish, for example, the way you're supposed to uh, with hazmat, you would never make any money. Um, so there are products like this. And, and in their case, it's a large product, this hazmat. So they cannot get a good enough deal with FedEx or UPS on shipping to make it make sense. And all of a sudden they don't have enough to, to have their products for, I think they've got like four days worth of sales in hazmat all of a sudden. It's crazy. Um, so if you're hit by something like this, or you ever have a different kind of restriction, you want to sell an aerosol product, which is a subcategory of hazmat, or you, de you make a deal with a distributor, and now you're going to be the sole Amazon seller for something that's a really hot seller, and you need more regular storage, there is something you can do. Now, I'm telling you straight up right now, the success rate is not super high. Um, but you can be persistent and do it multiple times and uh, you just might win. You have to make a business case to Amazon of why you have to have this. So this is what we're doing for that seller that I mentioned a few minutes ago. Most of my sellers who had their hazmat storage reduced, they weren't using that much. They don't really care. This guy cares. He needs their storage. He needs to pick up my storage <laughs> that I don't need, right? So you tell Amazon, I think I need this much. So you need to figure out what 30 days worth is in cubic feet. I need this much storage. I need it this date. So you have to explain to them whether it's seasonal. So it's either an all the time or it's only right before Christmas or whatever it is. And then you make a business case. So the business case has to have two sides to it. And this is the secret Amazon doesn't tell you. It has to have two sides. You need to explain to them why it's good for you and why it's good for them. Right. Because if it's not good for them, they don't care. <laughs> exactly. So if you're a private label seller, you're going to talk about selection on the platform and availability and quick fulfillment times. Um, because if you can only have four days worth, you're going to continually stock out and they're going to lose selection on the platform in that category. So in other words, people aren't going to be able to buy the product. Also, they probably have faster ship times on Hazmat than an individual seller. Um, so you, you talk about buyer experience, buyer experience, buyer experience, because that is what they care about. They care about buyer experience and how they're going to make more money and there's going to be more selection. So we've, we've had cases that we've won on increasing storage limits by using that strategy. We've had some that we've lost and then we resubmit it in a month and we resubmit it in a month and eventually it gets approved. Hmm. That's, ins that's insane. I mean, just that sounds like everything. So lately, you know, I'll get messages and, and emails and things like that from clients or people in the books. It's like, oh my gosh, I've been going round and round with Amazon for 30 to 60 days. And I was just like, this is the normal expectation. Don't ever yeah. assume that anything is going to resolve the first, second, or third time. The squeaky wheel gets the grease. Also, um, recently, people have talked about getting their 
problem solved by emailing Bezos or Jeff Bezos at, at amazon.com. And although some people say, oh, those don't get read, well, I've had very, very su high success rate with people emailing their problems after they've gone through Seller Central so many times, they email that and all of a sudden, magically in 24 hours, your problem's resolved. Has that been your experience as well? So not the 24 hour part, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, emailing Jeff is a very good strategy, but like you said, you really have to use all the other options at your disposal first. If you've not used all the other options at your disposal, they're going to ignore you for good reason, because you're going to the very, very top and you don't start at the top. Also, there is the captive team inside of seller support. Um, they handle what they call snowballs. So if you are someone who has contacted Amazon more than 10 times about one issue and it has not been solved, you are called a snowball. And because your problem is snowballing. And so the captive team is supposed to fix things for snowball. So you contact seller support and you ask for captive and then you insist on captive. But again, you have to have already tried several times to solve the problem with frontline, you know, tier one, tier two support. Not you don't just immediately jump up to captive. Um, writing to Jeff, he has a team of people who answer his email. Um, that is a well-known, my favorite Jeff story though, is because I'm not the biggest fan of Uncle Jeff, but it's because, yeah. of, my, it's because of my job. Yeah. Um, but one thing I do really like about Uncle Jeff is the question mark story is true, that at least for a long time, Jeff would read uh, several emails every day that came to his email address from buyers and sellers. And if the situation looked particularly dire or upsetting to him, he would forward it to the correct department with question marks at the top, just question marks, or occasionally with fix it or fix this, or are you kidding? <laughs> and that's all it would say. And it would come from his email address. And I have people who work for me at Riverbend who were the recipients of these emails sometimes and would get this escalation out of nowhere from Jeff saying, fix this or question mark, question mark. And you would literally drop everything to solve this problem. But most of them do go to his team and they read them and they triage them and they delete a lot of them. And then a lot of them they'll send to, uh, seller support or they'll send to seller performance and say, please research this. And if it gets researched and they decide it's not really an issue, they'll delete it. And that you will never hear from anyone. If they decide to not help you, you will never hear anything. And that is why a lot of people say that doesn't work because they tried and they just never got an answer. Um, that doesn't mean they're not read. Um, you know, I can't swear they're all read, but you know, a lot of them are just ignored because they don't, they don't care about your problem, but, but my, my best, so best advice for Jeff escalation, you need a great subject line, like a really great subject line that grabs their attention. So like a recent one that I wrote was Amazon employee extorting me for $1.6 million. Mm -hmm. um, that, which was true. And <laughs> that subject line got someone's attention because it said Amazon employee extorting me that, you know, so you got to make it really dire. And then you need to really get to the point. Bullet points don't have attachments because attachments can kick you out of executive emails. They won't even go through. Mm -hmm. They're not going to look at attachments. Um, all the attachments you've already sent, they're already in a case file somewhere at Amazon. So if it's sent to someone to research, it's already in there. Uh, but you can say, I have sent seller performance, blah, blah, blah. Or I have sent seller support, yada, yada. They know they can go find it. Um, yeah. So and be concise to the point. And some emotion is good, uh, not too much, but you have to have some emotion. Tell them why you desperation. Think, yeah, so I why think you that's why my client had success rate and quickly because her item was accidentally flagged as one of those product compliance kind of thing. It was a sticker. A little <laughs> child's sticker. It was, you know, she had all of the things that she needed, the testing, all this kind of stuff. She submitted them. She had over a hundred correspondence with Seller Central back and forth. A hundred. And so I think that's what was her subject line was something like, you know, a hundred correspondence with Seller Central, zero results or something, right. something that, like yeah, that. Something like that's like, great. 
And yep. then she had that, of course, they opened up, I, I'm guessing they opened up her case file and they realized that she was correct. She had been corresponding with them back and forth. She had been on the phone. One time she was on the phone four hours with the wait times and then someone passing the buck and someone else passing the buck. She did the captive thing. They kept trying to tell her that this product with the SDS sheets and the different test product testing that they did on these products for a sticker um, was and she had tens of thousands of dollars of e of inventory with this and that's why it was so desperate because she went all in on these because they were best sellers and so she was the only one she had an exclusive all these different things and then with the stickers or sticker books or whatever it was that, that they were doing and they basically kept rejecting her her forms because they said well these don't have dates on them of when these tests were tests were you know and then the, the company that I think it was maybe a closeout or, or they stopped making that or something wouldn't give them the, they said, this is all we've got. This is the testing. It passed. It was this. And then they said the documents didn't have dates. Well, then they finally found them that did have dates, but then they just decided that these dates were no longer relevant because it was so long ago. And so they needed to run the tests again. And she's like, well, the company's not producing these anymore so it was just this hot mess and it, either way it was like she was literally compliant as best as she could be giving them every single thing and they just kept going round and round with her and then when she did the whole bezos thing with a hundred and some correspondence or whatever it was um <laughs> they ended up saying okay this is not that big of a deal let's just get this done you know so sticker it's a, yeah, it's, it's not ingested. It's not even supposed to be stuck on skin. It's the sticker for a sticker book. Like, what is the problem here? So, yeah, some of these absolute ridiculous things like that. We're not talking about hoverboards or kitchen blow torches or DVD or supplements. It's a damn sticker. Like, what is the problem? So, I know I get a little hot under the collar when some of these things happen because I see really good people doing really great things and something stupid like that happens to them and it can ruin their whole business. It's like this oh, is yeah. one small one man show person just trying to supplement some income. And here comes, uh, you know, our frenemy Amazon that wants to just take us down for a sticker. So. Uh, I guess the moral of the story there, too, is uh, don't contact Uncle Jeff unless you have something that you have been running around the block with and you've tried every other avenue. And, um, you know, we don't use this once a week. We use this when we're, right. you know, really desperate to get something very, very important um, s stuck. Now, one last question here. I know we have to wrap up here in a minute, but um, a question I have is. The question of, is it worth it? So many friends, so many clients, so many sellers come and it's just like, well, I've got this product, but Amazon shut the listing down for something stupid and this and that. Is it even worth fighting for? Is it even worth anything? Are they, they just think that Amazon's always going to say no, always going to reject, always anything. Like at what point does it become not worth it? <laughs> That's a great question. And in fact, a lot of people ask that about selling on Amazon at all. Um, is it worth it to sell on Amazon? Do I just want to stay off of Amazon, use other channels? Do I just want to do Shopify store or whatever? Um, and I get that. I understand the frustration. So my first question is, is this something that creates a liability for you? If it creates a liability for you, like a product liability issue, no, it might not be worth it. And so that's the first. Thing. So if it's a sticker, obviously it's not creating a product liability issue for you. So we can just cross that off the list. Um, but that is always my first question about like the kitchen blow torch. Is this worth it for you? And eh, since, you know, people could take your house and everything you own. No, probably not. Um, so then moving to the next thing, how much have you put into it? Have you invested money and time in this product? Uh, is it truly okay to sell on Amazon? Is it something that really does not have an ingredient that's not allowed? Or are you really doing a good job on the packaging and you just had a few complaints for condition you sold as new because people make that complaint? Um, do you have invoices and, and they're just getting rejected, but you don't know why because they're actually decent invoices? If you're in the right and you have documentation, I think it's almost always worth it because you put money in this inventory and if you are going to sell it on eBay, you're not going to make as much out of it. You might not even cover your costs. It's just the nature of the beast. You can get a premium on Amazon, especially if you're selling something FBA and especially if it's private label and you don't have competition on the listing, like for a lot of your clients and people you work with. So really, truly, it is worth the aggravation um, if you're going to get your money back out of this product. 
because you do not want to pay Amazon to destroy your stuff. And then you look on the site one day and they're selling it on Amazon warehouse deals because <laughs> that will give you more of an ulcer than dealing with them. I mean, that's very upsetting. And you do not want to pay them to send it back to you because uh, trust me, when you open the box up, you're going to be very disappointed at how they packed it because they just <laughs> threw it in the boxes and it's not going to be a lot of it. 10 to 20%, you're going to have to chuck. It won't be. You mean like wine sellable. glasses in uh, bubble mailers without boxes? <laughs> I literally got back shards of glass in a bubble mailer from Amazon because they took a wine glass that had one layer of bubble wrap on it and literally put that in a poly bubble mailer and it arrived. I'm like, why is this shaky? I'm like, that could have been dangerous to me with all those. Glasses. Oh, yeah. I mean, I could have sued them for that. Right. But. That is the, that is the thing. I, I am in agreement with you. I would not teach Amazon to people if I didn't think that it was a long-term sustainable business that was worth the effort. But any business you're going to do has to be worth it to you. If mm -hmm. I, I have had clients bow out of Amazon because they said, I just can't take the headaches of all of this, these fires I'm putting out every day and all the constant compliance and all the stuff. And I'm like, yeah, maybe Amazon's not for you. But I look at this really nice salary that I'm making and this really, you know, a lot of revenue and the over a decade of, you know, working hard on Amazon to where it's worth it to some of the headaches and some of the, the stuff that's, we're all roll our eyes and it's annoying, but um, overall we have more success than we have problems. So I totally agree with you there. So, you know, bottom line today, you guys is, you know, avoid stuff like, you know, kitchen floaters. <laughs> I still just can't wrap my mind around that. Now I understand I bought one. I bought one from a local, like, party store or something. They sell some vape stuff, but I do pay pour painting with acrylic pour painting. Mm -hmm. And part of bringing the little cells out is using a kitchen torch. So I bought one from a local place, but I would never have thought to buy that on Amazon thinking they can't sell those there. Right. That's like butane and like fire, whatever. I just kind of laugh at that because I'm like, that just seems like the craziest thing to buy on Amazon. Um, but honestly, it's about being compliant with the rules and being, this is why we like the invoices, being upfront. There's nothing like him, them bringing the hammer down on you when you have no proof of anything and you know, you're just kind of dead in the water. So again, you know, thanks for the, you know, the hazmat issues that you guys have. Remember what Leslie said about um, making it basically how it's beneficial to them and how it's beneficial to you. I know a couple of you guys that do a lot of not necessarily aerosol, but some body sprays and things like that that you've got clearance for. And if that's, you know, a good chunk of your business, it's worth fighting for. So reach out to Leslie and her team. Of course, you can join us um, on the Facebook group with the code uh, mommyincome.com slash join us with the code word. Um, Riverbend, and that's we can get you into the Facebook group. You can also contact Leslie and her team um, at was it Riverbend Consulting? Riverbendconsulting.com. Yes. Yeah. Riverbendconsulting.com. They have a team of people that are fantastic. They can help you with all of your issues with these things and even preventative issues. So I am mm -hmm. a client of theirs and they give me my monthly reports of all the different things that come in the, your account health and things that are, might be red flags and the voice of the customer things. And it really helps us to improve our back end, our customer service, all of the things we're doing so that we just stay in the happy place. We stay where we don't have any of these red flags. And like, even as I was filling out, yes, I'm one of those crazy people that decided to fill out that stupid NFL, <laughs> the, the application that was like 27 pages and 23 uploads and documents and all that. We sell NFL branded products and we were approved to as, until now. And because of that, it was worth it to us to do all that. Um, but in the meantime, we've had things taken down for branding issues, intellectual property, mm -hmm. all the things. But it was was worth it to us and it still is. So um, those are the things you guys kind of keep those in the happy places and point out where we're might be falling short of it. So you guys, you can always reach out to Leslie and her team. They are fantastic. Riverbendconsulting.com. And you will also see her back here several times a year because she's our favorite in-house Amazon. She's like helping us the Amazon police. <laughs> so they're going to <laughs> gonna help us with all of these crazy issues and help us to just get through it, make us feel like we're not alone, that lots of other people are going 
going through this. And regardless of how much of a pain it is, there are solutions and there are resolutions. So don't give up. Don't throw in the towel because that's kind of what they want you to do. They don't want you to yes. keep bothering them. But um, you know what? The squeaky wheel gets the grease. And if you are truly in the right and not um, violating the certain policies, um, you can get things resolved when you're just, if your porch is clean, you don't have to worry about all the messy stuff and you're not in, you know, you're not in the wrong. So again, Leslie, thank you so much for coming here um, often and sharing your wisdom and knowledge with us. We really appreciate you. Thank you. It's always so fun to talk with you, Kristen. Awesome. All right, you guys, we'll see you same time, same place next week on the Amazon Files.